Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. As always, uh, happy whatever day it is, happy whatever time it is that you're watching this. Welcome to episode 130 of Left Side of the Aisle. I'm your host, my name is Larry Erickson, and for the next half hour I'm going to be ranting away at you about things that I think you should care about. Uh, as always, if you have any reactions to the show, uh, you can email me directly. The email address is hoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G, at AOL.com. Um, and if you didn't catch that, you can go to my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, and you can leave a comment there, or you can get the email address from there. If you do send me email, I just have two requests. One, include something in the subject line, like your cable show or something, so I know it's not spam. And two, be a little patient. I can be a little slow about answering my email, but I do answer it. You will get an answer. So, with those traditional introductions out of the way, we're going to get to it. Uh, and I have to tell you, for the first half of the show this week, uh, we're going to be happy. I've got two bits of good news and four, count them, four hero awards. Uh, so we'll start with the good news. Up first, it develops that there actually is a limit to how far the Supreme Court will go to push the Second Amendment in service to the nutsoid rabbit brains of America, otherwise known as the NRA, uh, and the gun lobby. The court has refused to hear a challenge to a Maryland law that requires people who want permits for handguns to demonstrate a, quote, good and substantial reason, unquote, for carrying a weapon outside their own home or business. The challenge came from a guy named Raymond Woolard and the Second Amendment Foundation, who say, guess what, it violates the Second Amendment. Now, the thing is, Woolard obtained a permit for a gun in 2002 after a, uh, 2002 after a home invasion, but was not able to get that permit renewed in 2009. Uh, because the Maryland law doesn't recognize just like a vague and generalized fear as an appropriate basis for getting a gun permit. And officials said that Woolard failed to demonstrate any ongoing risk or danger to him seven years after the event. The Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals upheld the law, and the Supreme Court has now said, let her ride. Finally. All right, the other bit of good news is one, I would be willing to bet good money that, that you, at least most all of you, um, have never heard about. It does have some connection to the first, but I'm willing to bet you haven't heard of this. On September 25th, acting on behalf of the United States, Secretary of State John Kerry signed the Arms Trade Treaty. Now what this treaty does, it requires the governments that sign it to not sell or transfer arms where there is an overriding risk, quote unquote, that the weapons will support genocide, crimes against humanity, or war crimes. It also requires those governments to require effective arms import and export control systems and to cooperate to share information about the international arms trade, something that very often, most of the time, occurs in the shadows. More than 90 other nations have signed, but a lot of the top arms producers and sellers have not, which is one reason why this is important. The United States is the world's largest arms dealer. Uh, we are the largest, and its signing is seen as crucial to the success of this treaty. Now, that remains true even though this signing of it is mostly a symbolic act uh, for, for two reasons. One, because um, existing laws of the United States would uh, very likely be more than enough to satisfy all the requirements of the treaty. Now. Those laws are often enough not enforced or wished away by some presidential finding or another, but the fact is they do exist and that's actually an issue for another time. The issue here is that the uh, signing, however, is doubly symbolic. It's symbolic and merely symbolic in another way because the chances of the Senate actually endorsing this treaty are, let's be optimistic and say, minimal. Beyond the expected Gopper defense, uh, uh, or their response, rather, uh, as it is to most everything these days, to act like a spoiled six-year-old brat stomping their feet and going, no, uh, the fact is that some of the dim bulbs of the other party, uh, and this is the real connection to the other bit of good news, they're going to embrace the bull that this treaty violates the Second Amendment. 
The fact is, the treaty, this treaty only applies to the international arms trade. It specifically and explicitly leaves it up to the signatory nations to determine how they are going to regulate and control their own domestic arms trade. Anyone who tells you uh, that this treaty limits, violates, or even has anything to do with the Second Amendment is either lying to you or has no idea what they're talking about. And considering here we're talking about members of Congress and various other right-wingers, it could be either one of those. Now even so, for all its symbolic nature, signing this treaty was still a good thing. It was still the right thing to do. It's still good news and good on the Obama administration for doing it. And I don't get to say that about them very often, so I'm taking advantage of the opportunity. All right, moving on from there, I have, as I said, four, count them, four Hero Awards. Now, the Hero Award is something that we give around here on occasion for people who, on a matter big or small, just do the right thing. All right, first off, you need to know that last week, eight Democratic members of Congress joined with thousands of other activists at a rally in March in Washington, D.C., in favor of comprehensive immigration reform, which seems to have stalled in the GAPA ruled, which actually means the teabagger ruled House of Representatives. How stalled, by the way? The House Gopper leadership says there will not, uh, there'll be no vote on the Senate immigration bill, the, the Senate has passed a bill, or anything else that a majority of House Goppers oppose. In other words, a part of a part of a part of the legislative branch can not only keep legislation from passing, it can keep it from there even being a vote on it. Um, a hero is something that uh, House Speaker John Boner is not. Anyway, the, the D.C. demo was more than one of 160 such actions that took place in various places around the country on the same day. But uh, at a rally, after a rally on the National Mall in the D.C. one, at a march to the West Lawn of the White House, those eight members of Congress, and they are Representatives Luis Gutierrez, John Lewis, Keith Ellison, Raul Grijalva, Joe Crowley, Al Green, Jan Schakowsky, and Charlie Rango, they joined about 200 others in blocking traffic on the streets in front of the Capitol um, and an act of nonviolent civil disobedience. All 200 plus of those people, in my opinion, are heroes. But I wanted to single out one for special note, John Lewis. After the rally, his office issued a statement noting that this was the 45th time Lewis had been arrested for civil disobedience. Lewis is an icon of what's been called the civil rights era of the 1960s and was arrested about 40 times during that period. And he's now been busted five times as a member of Congress, twice to, proto uh, to protest apartheid, uh, twice to protest a genocide in Darfur, and now to push for immigration reform. That man is a hero. By the way, as a footnote, I should mention that four Republicans turned out for the rally as well. They were Representatives Mario diaz Balart, uh, Jeff Valadeo, um, David rather, Valadeo, sorry, Jeff Denham, and Elena ross Lettinen. They didn't participate in the civil disobedience, but they were on stage for the rally. Good for them. All right, our second hero award is also a group one. About three weeks ago, a suicide bomber hit All Saints Church in Peshawar, Pakistan. The attack occurred after Sunday Mass and killed something over 100 people. It's thought to be the country's deadliest attack ever on Christians. In response, the following Sunday, a group called Pakistan for All described, as a, described itself as a collection of citizens concerned about the growing attacks on minorities formed a human chain outside St. Patrick's Cathedral in Karachi to protect the congregants and to declare their solidarity with the victims of the attack under the slogan, One Nation, One Blood. Last week they did it again. They flew from Karachi to Lahore to form a human chain of as many as two to three hundred people outside St. Anthony's Church, bringing Muslim and Christian communities together in a show of solidarity against religious bigotry and terrorism. Muhammad Gibran Nasir, the organizer who made the calls for the event, said, quote, well, the terrorists showed us what they do on Sundays. Here we are showing what we do on Sundays. We unite heroes, every one of them. 
Okay, our third here award is smaller by comparison, but you know, still worthy of mention. Drew Racinger is the Registrar of Deeds for Buncombe County, North Carolina. And he's creating a challenge to a 2012 state amendment to the Constitution which bans same-sex marriages. He says he will accept marriage licenses from same-sex couples and then hold the licenses and ask Attorney General Roy Cooper for legal advice. Racinger said he had been forced to deny marriage licenses to upstanding citizens because of this, and he felt like that was just not fair. Racinger's announcement came just hours after Attorney General Cooper revealed that he personally supports same-sex marriage. But Cooper also said his personal views will not prevent him from defending the law in court, which may well be true, and it's possible, even probable, that uh, Racinger's actions will, for the moment, go nowhere. But the point is, this does put the question to Cooper. Will you actually defend a provision you believe is wrong? Or would you, could you, might you, as Eric Holder did in the case of the Defense of Marriage Act, just decide not to mount a defense? For using his official position to raise that question, Drew Racinger is a hero. And finally, a slam dunk hero award. Nancy Salgado is a 26-year-old single mother with two children. She's also a cashier at a McDonald's in Chicago. She makes $8.25 an hour. She's been working at McDonald's since she was 16 and has never gotten a raise. Last week, she interrupted a speech by Jeff Stratton, president of McDonald's USA at some fancy schmancy dinner or another, uh, and telling him she's worked at McDonald's for 10 years and can't afford shoes for her children. She was promptly arrested, but not before leaving Stratton flustered and tongue-tied. His only response was, I've been there 40 years, as if that was relevant to the question. No one in response asked Stratton how many raises he'd gotten in that time or how his kids were fixed for shoes. By the way, just parenthetically, there are moves in Massachusetts this year to raise the minimum wage and to require employers to provide earned sick time. Uh, one group is now working to get initiatives on the November 2014 ballot in case the legislative efforts fail. But getting back to Nancy Salgado, Nancy, you are not only a hero, you rock. All right, uh, one more thing before we go to break. Uh, this is the Clown Award, given for meritorious stupidity. Feel free to laugh. This week, the big red nose goes to Representative Steve Pierce, a gopper from New Mexico, who posted this bit of sage wisdom on his personal Facebook page. If you are a furloughed, I'm quoting him here, if you are a furloughed government employee, we encourage you to reach out to your financial institution as soon as you worry you may miss a paycheck. Financial institutions often offer short-term loans and other resources. Don't wait until you are behind on a bill. Call now and explore your options. Yeah, that's right. If you've been laid off because of the stupidity and venality of right-wing bozos like Steve Pierce and are worried about your ability to pay your bills, don't worry, be happy, take out a loan. <laughs> of course, you know, why didn't we all think of that, really? Of course, borrowing money off uh, on no income, going even further into personal debt, is a great idea. And of course, banks will be happy to lend you money based on your own signature when they have no idea when you'll be able to start paying it back. <laughs> of course, that's true. What a clown. Uh, doubling his clownishness, this post was then taken down, and his, often, his office rather lamely, if entirely predictably, blamed the badly worded post on an unnamed staffer. Now exactly why unnamed staffers are able to put up uncleared posts on Pierce's personal Facebook page was unexplained, also predictably. Pierce says he's working without pay during the shutdown, but considering he's worth about $8 million, I doubt that he's really feeling a financial pinch or that he needs to take out a loan. Progress Now New Mexico, noting that Pierce's constituents are among the poorest in the country, suggests they should call him and ask him for a loan. After all, the group says if he's so sure that private loans are the answer, he should be the first to offer them. We're going to take a break.
And here we are back again. I'm uh, going to start here. We've got two brief RIPs this week. Uh, the first is going to be brief because I'm sure you heard about this one. Former astronaut, aquanaut, and techno thriller author Scott Carpenter died on October 10th at the age of 88 after suffering a recent stroke. Carpenter was the fourth American to fly in space. He was the second American to orbit the Earth, taking off on May 24th, 1962. He uh, swung both ways, if you will. Besides being an astronaut, an experience he described as transcending and one he wished everyone could have, he was also an aquanaut and spent a record 30 days on the ocean floor aboard the Navy Sea Lab 2, an experimental habitat which is located off the coast of California. So, R.I.P. Scott Carpenter. Our other IP is someone that I expect you haven't heard about, so I'm going to be a little longer about him. His name was Joe Bell. Joe Bell's 15-year-old son, Jaden, killed himself in February after being bullied by classmates over his homosexuality. In response to this event, Joe Bell vowed to walk across the entire country, speaking and raising awareness about uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender youth along the way. He set up from his home state of Oregon in late April, planning to walk 15 to 25 miles a day and speak on behalf of the group Faces for Change, which is an anti-bullying foundation established in his son's memory. On October 9th, he was struck and killed by a semi while walking through Colorado. The driver, who may have, been, who may have fallen asleep, was charged with reckless driving. Ogden Outreach of Utah held a memorial service in his memory, but personally I think the best way to memorialize Joe Bell is to make future such pilgrimages unnecessary. R.I.P. Joe Bell. All right, this next, this is something you definitely absolutely need to know about. Last Tuesday, October 8th, the Supreme Court heard oral arguments in the case of McCutcheon v. Federal Ex Election Commission, a case that could do more to undermine any hope of putting any limits on the influence of money in political campaigns than even the infamous Citizens United case did. Now that one, uh, wrapped in the flag and parading as a blow for free speech, the Citizens United decision, which was in 2010, gave corporations and the rich an opening to pour vast and, almost, uh, an, and often anonymous amounts of money into political campaigns. Combined with the rise of super PACs, this has already flooded our election system with unprecedented, huge amounts of money. But uh, so far, we've managed to keep a little a little distance, a little daylight, or at least the appearance of a little distance, between the money and the candidates themselves. McCutcheon could eliminate even that porous barrier. Here's the deal. Under current law, there are limits on the total amount of money an individual can donate to state and national party committees, as well as PACs and individual candidates per federal election cycle, that is every two years. Put simply, during a single election cycle, an individual can donate no more than $48,600 to all federal candidates for office and no more than $74,600 to party committees that make contributions to candidates for a total of $123,200 every two years. You can spread that money out any way you want, but you can't exceed those aggregate limits. McCutcheon v. Federal Election Commission would eliminate or could eliminate those limits, allowing our millionaires and billionaires even more control over political campaigns and candidates than they have now. Now, McCutcheon in this case is a guy named Sean McCutcheon. He's from Alabama and he's the chair of the Conservative Action Fund. Uh, which, uh, and he says it is a horrendous violation of his free speech rights that he can't give as much as he wants to as many as he wants. And he and his fat cr cat cronies would like to see this changed. Uh, parenthetically, by the way, he's also a climate change denier, but that's, you kind of expect that with these people. At oral arguments, observers said that it appeared that a slim majority of the court was receptive to McCutcheon's free speech argument. Uh, although I frankly wonder if that's because of some deep philosophic commitment to the First Amendment, a commitment which seems to be remarkably lacking in some other cases, such as students' rights, uh, or is it rather a deep philosophic commitment to the power of money? But let's be specific about the case, okay? Let's be specific. 
Sean McCutcheon is looking to get rid of the aggregate limits on donations. He's not seeking to have the individual limits overturned. That is limits on how much you can give to one committee or one candidate, uh, but only the overall ceiling. Put simply, he says he's okay with, you can't give more than X dollars to such and such a candidate. He just wants to be able to give, to give that much to as many candidates as he wants without a limit on the total amount of money that he donates. The thing is, the real hand grenade in this, the real danger, the real thing that threatens to blow up limits entirely, is that Senate Minority Leader Fishface McConnell is trying to use the case as a vehicle to get the Supreme Court to dismantle contribution limits altogether. And uh, perhaps indicating the court's leanings, unfortunately, his lawyer was permitted to intervene in the case and given an opportunity to make that argument during oral arguments. In 1976, in the case Buckley v. Vallejo, the Supreme Court ruled that campaign contribution limits were constitutional on the grounds that such limits were only a marginal restriction on free speech, one which is justified by the government's interest in preventing corruption or the appearance of corruption. Unfortunately for us now, in Citizens United, one of the things that was kind of overlooked, uh, the court narrowed its definition of corruption to exclude buying access to politicians or ingratiating your, yourself with them, characterizing corruption as something closer to outright bribery. Justice Kennedy wrote for the majority that, quoting, ingratiation and access in any event are not corruption. In other words, during an election campaign, go to a politician and say, I'll donate this much to your campaign if you'll vote this way on such and such bill. Uh, that's corruption. After an election, go to a politician who knows damn well how much money you contributed to their campaign, which is why they're so happy to make time for you, and say, gee, I'd appreciate this vote on such and such a bill. That's not corruption. I like to call that kind of argument a distinction without a difference. But it's that kind of hair splitting that, that Fishface is using to justify a call for turning our elections into a true financial free for all. According to the Sunlight Foundation, most of the funding for congressional and presidential campaigns already comes from the top 1% of the top 1%, uh, the people they call the elite class that serves as gatekeepers of public office in the United States, quote unquote, for the group. If the court embraces Fishface's arguments, it not only would make political campaigns even more the playground of the rich and powerful than they already are, not only would that make access to elected officials even more the prerogatives of the powerful than it already is, it would also leave, uh, leave alternatives to our already squashed political debates even more, because uh, it would leave uh, alternatives even more in the wilderness because third parties have become even more disadvantaged than they already are. It could almost make participation in the political process pointless. The justices will issue their opinion on McCutcheon before the end of next June. Hang on, folks. This could be bad, or it could be really bad. All right. Uh, now, having looked at the financial side of the right wing's plan to turn the word democracy into just an empty slogan to be trotted out on special occasions, let's check out some recent news on the voting side, on the efforts to make it ever harder for people to vote. This is the outrage of the week. The state of Kansas is planning on instituting a two-tier system for voters, restricting what races you're allowed to vote in based on what kind of voter registration form you use. This move is the brainchild of Kansas Secretary of State Chris Kobach, who wants to force people to provide proof of citizenship in order to register to vote. Now this, to be clear again, this is to register to vote. It's entirely separate from the demand to show photo ID when you actually go to, as is, is increasingly true, try to vote. The thing is, if you register to vote with a federal form rather than the Kansas state form, there's no requirement to prove citizenship. Instead, the person registering signs a statement under, pain of per, uh, under, under penalty of perjury saying that they are a citizen. Now, that, of course, is not good enough for Kobach, who, by the way, was also a driving force behind Arizona's infamous SB 1070, the Your Papers, Please law, uh, ethnic profiling law. 
uh, and he ran for his present office on a pledge to stamp out voter fraud in Kansas before winning and then not being able to find any. Um, in this case, Kobach has sued the federal government to force it to include the state's requirement for proof of citizenship along with the federal form. Meanwhile, Kobach has sent a memo to all the state's county election officials instructing them to keep track of which voters register with the federal form and which voters register with the state form so that the former group can be limited to voting only in federal level elections and banned from voting in state or local races. And what's more, anyone who submits the state form without the required proof of citizenship uh, will be barred from voting in any election until they provide it. Presently, about 17,500 voters, previously registered voters, in Kansas are now, quote, in suspense, unquote, as a result of this new requirement. Now, he calls this memo a contingency plan in case he loses in court. I call it a cynical, disgusting scheme because he knows he's going to lose in court, considering his prove your citizen law is already under challenge and a very similar law already was rejected by the Supreme Court, uh, in that case from Arizona. Kobach's analysis is that that decision only applies to federal elections. Quoting him, the federal government doesn't have the authority to tell Kansas what to do in Kansas elections. Actually, unfortunately for him and happily for the right to vote, it does. The 14th and 15th Amendments provide more than enough legal backing to undo the legal sleight of hand that Kobach's trying to pull off. So in the moderately long run, this particular scheme is likely to fail. But uh, Kobach and the others of his ilk do not care about that. They shoot for the win. But for the moment, they are happy, even if all they succeed in doing is creating FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt in the minds of the people, the poor, the young, students, minority, the people they want to keep from voting. The battle for the right to vote goes on. Oh, and as a footnote to this, State uh, Representative, Kansas State Representative Jim Ward, who, appro who opposes the Prove It law, says he once asked Kobach how voter registration workers should collect the documentation now needed to register under the new law. Kobach's answer was, quote, carry a copy machine with you. Which attitude pretty much tells you all you need to know about Chris Kobach's commitment to the right to vote. All right, that's it for this week. We're going to wrap up with our weekly reminder. As of October 15th, at least 9,388 people have been killed by guns in the United States since Newtown. At least 89 of those in Massachusetts. So that's it. We're going to wrap up for this week. We will see you again next week. You have the best week you possibly can. And then check us back. Okay, bye.